in a little bit about the work that uh, we've been doing here at ECST. Uh, and the topic is traffic management and optimization in multi-layered wider area networks using SDN. Um, so before I get started, I would like to give you a little bit, uh, so an outline on the brief review of what I will talk about and in this talk. And I will basically uh, briefly discuss uh, uh, composition of wide area networks, how we view them and uh, what are the steps and what are, what are the layers that I'm going to be talking about. I'll talk a little bit about some protocols that are used uh, to both forward traffic and manage these wide area networks. And I will also touch uh, a little bit on traffic behavior uh, that flows through these wide area networks and uh, in terms of the applications that we actually build the networks to carry traffic for. And also uh, a little bit about network abstractions for optical switching components that is part of the work that we've done. Um, and I will talk also a little bit about software-defined networking, uh, which is a very important topic that is uh, actively being discussed today in the literature, in academia, and also in the industry. And also how this relates to optical switches. So to get started, I would like to give a brief overview of what a net, what a wide area network is. And I'm sure most of you, and if not all of you, are familiar of uh, what a wide area network is and why this is a critical resource for performance and, and reliability of the internet. Because it's basically the core interconnection between metro areas uh, and long, using long distance links that carry data um, from applications that we access every day. Like Google, Amazon, they all have data centers that might be far away from you and might be close to you and also lots of other types of applications. So because uh, wide area networks are the core of the traffic, uh, the core of the internet, uh, internet network infrastructure, they carry a massive tracket, traffic from several different uh, applications. And this goes over several long distance links and also uh, not uh, intercontinental but close by links. And as this network grows, uh, they usually aggregate equipment from different vendors uh, and with different technologies, what makes them a little bit more expensive to deploy and operate. Uh, and because you're usually, when you have multiple vendors uh, composing the network, they usually have proprietary uh, interfaces that operators usually have to, uh, to know how to configure uh, and how know how to interconnect them together. And there are some, because of this, uh, this uh, scenario, there are some problems that are really uh, well known in the literature. And two of them are that these networks, they usually don't have a high resource utilization. Uh, and some uh, big companies usually report uh, 30 to 50%. And because of this uh, mixed scenario, you also have low measurement flexibility. Um, and these problems are actually addressed uh, in recent work by some very interesting papers and in, um, top networking conferences. And two of them is basically Google's um, B4 system that basically manages their inter wide area network that interconnect their data centers. And also Microsoft SWAN, which basically does the same. And the interesting thing about this works is that they follow the same pattern. Uh, they propose ways to improve network utilization, flexibility, and resilience, basically using uh, centralized management for both of them and a unified management interface. And in that case, it was OpenFlow protocol. However, there is a, a common problem between these two systems, uh, which is that they the traffic engineering and all the decisions uh, that they make to optimize the network are restricted to routers and IP or packet layer. So basically on the OSI layer tree that is internet working. And to understand a little bit why this is a problem and why uh, these works don't address that, I would like to step back and think about how we compose wide area networks or how we, we build these wide area networks today. So as we all know, uh, before we actually start building the network, 
we do some planning and decide where to lay down fibers. And we actually connect to this uh, using technologies like WDM, OADM. And at this layer of the network, after we do the engineering to estimate the traffic demands that we go through each one of these fibers, uh, we usually install this equipment and do uh, switching and routing in this layer using uh, lambdas, or we basically uh, route using wavelengths here. And then, as you might also be familiar, we also have uh, some transport equipment that basically does um, regeneration by doing optical electrical conversion. And you, at this layer, we basically use, use protocols such as SONET or SDH, and we are able to do sub, uh, sub lambda routing, or basically do we here we is where we do traffic grooming, and basically can subdivide the bandwidth capacity available in a lambda, and by bandwidth is bandwidth capacity uh, to forward data. And at the the last stage is where we have the routing and the IP or TCP/IP layer, and the problem with this is that when you look at how we manage this, these networks, we see that all the management uh, protocols and uh, everything, all the protocols that we use to manage and route traffic across these different layers, they are basically independent. And we don't actually uh, have the ability to do configurations or do routing passing across all these layers unless we use very uh, different systems and try to stitch them together. And the question that we're trying to answer in this uh, work is basically, is basically, uh, can we manage all these layers using a unified abstraction? And some, some might ask, well, why are you doing that? Uh, we're actually been doing and building networks, wide area networks, the way that you described for ages and it's been working fine. And actually, um, I heard that this is one of the most dangerous uh, questions in the human history, why we're going to change the things that we've been doing for ages. And I actually have uh, some scenarios uh, to, to talk to you about and why this, this would be interesting. So one of them is uh, the thing that we're trying to do, which is multi-layer traffic optimization. And the simplest example that you can, you can give here is if you have only dynamic allocation of bandwidth um, at short time scales at the upper layers, what you end up having is uh, if the demand from application grows, you need to go down to the other layers and add new paths manually or ask for other teams even in the same company, in the same carrier. And that is a time consuming process and actually you introduce a lot of delay. What happens here is that you end up offering degraded service in that scenario and the current solutions, because they don't have access to the other layers of the network, they basically either throttle traffic or they make the application suffer with this degraded service. Another thing that is actually, uh, another advantage that is actually being talked a lot in the industry is bandwidth virtualization. And bandwidth virtualization basically means that you can go to uh, lower layers of the network and actually allocate fractions of that bandwidth or basically sub lambda and even lower than that um, for applications using lower layers instead of only using routing and IP layers. And the reason for that, or the motivation for that, is that as we put more and more bandwidth in a single lambda, or as we can put more traffic in a single lambda, if we do the traditional static allocation of these higher uh, capacity optical pipes, you can basically waste a lot of capacity if you face variable demands. And in terms of variable demands, uh, there's actually a very interesting work from David Maltz group, which is from Microsoft where they analyzed variations in traffic patterns uh, in data centers. And this work was actually published in the Internet Measurement Conference, a very good one as well. And you can see that uh, across the days of a week and the traffic uh, traces that they had, there is a very common variation in traffic pattern uh, for a core data center link, which is the link that interconnects the data center with the outside work, world, or basically the wide area network. And if you actually, uh, they actually tried to summarize that for several uh, data center traces in a CDF. So what you see in the CDF is basically um, a bunch of data points uh, that 
show the difference between the maximum throughput at one instant and the average of that stent. For each one of these uh, data centers, uh, those codes are uh, here on the side. So they had access to educational, private, and cloud data centers, and each one of these lines represent that. And you can see that most of them follow the same pattern, uh, with, and in some of them, more than 50% of the link uh, or the throughput uh, demand that the, you see on the link on the data center varies by more than 10% or more than 50% of the time. So that is important. So band visualization is important. That's why there's a lot of tension in this, in this case. And another one that might not be uh, as intuitive is that whenever you're having demands or flows uh, in the last point here, the third point is that whenever you have different applications share, sharing, for example, a circuit, an optical circuit, the interaction of these flows might, be, might also lead to lower utilization uh, of your network. And we actually run an experiment to show uh, when this happens and why this happens. And I want to share this experiment with you. So here, in this figure, you can see um, that set up that we had uh, two sites or basically two clusters of computers and we have two layers in and the first layer the upper layer you see two routers uh, and they are interconnected uh, to two uh, transport devices on a lower layer that does optical transmission and we establish one single circuit of 10 gigabits per second between these two sites and what we did in this experiment is we, we sent a lot of small flows, which are basically HTTP requests to download websites such as Facebook, CNN, or Amazon that is uh, depicted on the, uh, the left side. And we send this uh, request, or C concurrent request, to site B, from site A to site B, through the optical circuit that we see on the bottom, on the optical, trans uh, on the optical uh, transport network. So, as we expect, uh, the bandwidth consumed by these small flows, or these concurrent small flows, here I show the graphs for C equals 4 and C equals 8, you see that throughput is far uh, lower than uh, the bandwidth available on the circuit, right? Uh, over time, you see that there is not a lot of variation because we keep the number of concurrent flows consistent. However, if you put a large flow when, you, when a large flow is started under this network and shares uh, this optical circuit with all those small flows, uh, what you might expect is that the, the bandwidth utilization of the circuit would go to 100% because uh, basically the large flow has is transferring gigabytes of data and it should be able to use the entire capacity of the circuit. But what actually ends up happening is that you have a much lower utilization than you expect. And this graph, what I plot here uh, in this set of bars, is different uh, versions of TCP that, that, or the transport protocol that are implemented on the servers. They are supposed to deal with this uh, concurrent access of uh, resources and utilize the entire bandwidth. But what ends up happening is that you basically, on average, use half of that bandwidth capacity. And the reason for that is that um, the applications are not aware of what's, uh, what's going on and they are trying to adapt uh, to the bandwidth that they think is available on a circuit. And then the congestion control on TCP, uh, triggered by the intermittent uh, small flows, contributes to a poor utilization. And if we see why uh, this happens, um, if we look at the TCP behavior uh, when there are packet drops, which is basically what is happening there in the contention, uh, we understand what, it's, what is the big problem uh, in that scenario. Why is the interaction affecting them? And here in this graph that I'm showing you, uh, we have the theoretical and uh, the measured throughput of TCP, uh, Reno is one of the versions that we experimented there, with uh, a very small percentage of loss. And we see that depending on the round trip time, uh, or as the bigger it gets, the worse, uh, the, we see that the TCP basically has a very, very decreased throughput. So there is a lot of work to be done in that case, especially if you think that uh, the typical um, round trip time uh, for a wide network, end-to-end, um, -end from server to server, 
is basically a few tens of uh, microseconds. So if you actually want to look a little, see a little bit more of this work, I put a link here, uh, and you can basically uh, dive deep in this uh, in this study. So I would like to summarize the challenges uh, that we had to deal with this work in this work. So the first one is basically network representation. So when we're we're dealing with the packet network where all the dynamic uh, traffic is and while the where all the dynamic traffic engineering is being done, we can basically have an automatic network representation. So we can build an overview of the network uh, where we can do traffic engineer on it. Basically by connecting one cable to the other, you can basically identify where or which devices are connected to each other. However, we don't have that functionality in the lower, lower layers and that complicates a little bit uh, to perform traffic engineering and to to do rail routing in a network that you actually don't know. And what we actually have today is we have to build uh, this view of the network manually uh, for lower layers. There is also multiple management and control interfaces uh, that I actually described before. So we have several uh, different management interfaces for different layers. And also the equipment are a little bit different. So uh, for example, in the Sonnet, you don't have a lot of queuing, whereas if you're doing with routing, you actually have queuing and you have a better link sharing uh, of the network. There is also distinct traffic visibility. Basically, uh, the reason, the meaning here is that when you're dealing with routing and electric, electric packets, you know, digital packets, you can basically see the headers and you know what packet flows, where they are going, and what is the source and destination of those. And if you go lower to sub lambda, you you might have TDM slots, but you don't know what the packet flows are in that, and so on and so forth for wavelengths and lower layers. And also, you have different management granularity when you deal with different layers. So to deal with all these challenges, we actually try to design a system um, that we hope to be uh, easily available and uh, could be easily adopt adopted by industry and basically we can build other things on top of that as well. And to do that, we actually try to use an unmodified version of the OpenFlow protocol. And we use actually an unmodified SDN controller. We did all the logic outside of that. And we actually, to test that, we built a prototype. And here I have a picture of that prototype that we had, which is basically what is represented in the, in the picture on the right, uh, the bottom right uh, of this slide. So on the picture you see uh, three transport devices that Infinera um, uh, provided us to use and experiment with. Uh, and we access them remotely because this uh, is actually at, uh, uh, Infinera, at Infinera, it's not here at ECSD. And you can see that there are some fibers, a uh, bundle of fibers going to very tiny devices, those are the electrical packet switches. The three uh, uh, white and blue are the Infinera uh, DTNX uh, that can do um, Sonat SD8 and also Lambda forwarding and they also are offering super channel of up, at, up to 100 gigabits per second uh, now. And the servers are actually not in this picture, they are in the rack on the back of this, uh, this picture. So I would like to talk a little bit about uh, each one of the components um, that are depicted on this picture. But before diving into that, I would like to remind you of what, uh, what are the tasks that, take, uh, that have to take in, that be taken into account when you're doing traffic engineering. And usually when you're building a traffic engineering system, you have a cycle. And that cycle is you basically try to figure out what is the demand that is in the network. You, have, you, want, you try to map that to uh, ports or where sources uh, of entry in the network. And with all this information, topology in demand, you have a controller uh, that will basically uh, it actually enforce the traffic engineering and figure out what is the best way to place this traffic on the network. And then at the later stage, uh, you, you're going to reroute the traffic. And basically what we try to do is we try to have visibility of all the layers 
So we can basically manage and reroute traffic both in uh, IP and uh, uh, OSI layer 3 uh, and also at transport layer and basically um, levels below. So I, I also want to mention that this is a centralized approach just the same way as uh, uh, Google and Microsoft uh, systems that I talked before were doing. Instead of a distributed approach, that is also uh, being shown that is not does not achieve the optimal uh, optimization that you can have in the in terms of traffic routing and traffic engineering. So to start with, I would like to briefly talk about the mutual layer topology app, which is the module that we basically uh, try to build a complete view of the network uh, for both the layer three and IP uh, devices or routers and switches um, that do digital and OSI layer 3 for wording and also to the lower layers. So what we did here, we used a combination of protocols that are available for routing uh, to, for example, LLDP, which is a protocol that's used uh, for a discover, link layer discovery protocol, which is a protocol that you, you basically try to uh, find interconnections between a higher layer uh, networks and also uh, we used we used uh, uh, algorithms to try to find paths under the network by basically reconfiguring and trying to uh, to reconfigure other possibilities of interconnections and analyzing when we have actually a link uh, in a higher layer that we can identify uh, that we were able to establish a route between two higher layers and lower layers in the network. So, so this is actually um, complicated to scale, so it, it's not really a scalable solution because we're doing an uh, exhaustive search for paths in the network. And what we actually do here is uh, we, we also give the possibility for any proprietary uh, topology um, information that could be provided to the system to complement what our system can find on the network. Oops. Uh, okay, I think I have some problems. All right, we continue. Uh, so, going one step forward is after we have this topology information and basically uh, the statistics and demands, uh, statistics and demands of uh, the traffic that's going and flowing through the network, we we can basically run the actually uh, the uh, path computation engine to find routes for a given demand in the network. And what we use here actually is because we were able to figure out the entire network graph, we can then use traditional algorithms uh, to find paths in the, this graph. However, one problem is that not all the paths can do the same or can have the same characteristics and the way we handle that in this flat graph of the network is basically we use the hierarchical um, multi-stage uh, computation to find what paths are suitable for each uh, demand or for each uh, pairwise demand that we see uh, when we collect the topology and demand in the first step. And I'm not going to dive into details in here, um, but I will provide you a link of uh, a paper that I actually discuss how to implement that and basically in high level what happens is uh, if you have this multi-stage computation you basically have a flow uh, of those per number constraints that I talked on the previous slide where you basically restrict uh, the path selection uh, for each stage depending on the, the, the capabilities uh, of each one of the links that you have in the network. So, um, and this is a, a high-level picture of how this would uh, work and how the paths would be given to a multi-layer provisioning, provisioning, which is the next step. And the multi-layer provisioning, before I talk about that, which is basically uh, the step where we're going to go ahead and make changes in the network. And before I actually talk about how to make changes in the network, in this multi-layer uh, network, I would like to talk a little bit about software-defined networking, 
and how we actually manage these network switches. So um, I, uh, I'm sure that most of you are aware of what software defined networking is, but in high level, what software defined networking allows you is uh, it allows you to manage network resources or services using an abstraction, which is something that computer scientists love, which you basically abstract lower level functionalities uh, of a system with a simpler interface that allows you to expand. And for the, at the beginning of this uh, new uh, age of software defined networking that is growing a lot, was at the core of that was OpenFlow. And OpenFlow is basically the protocol uh, that allows uh, a computer program to control a switch in a very abstract and generic way. So here at the lower uh, right corner of the picture, I have a, a high level view of how an OpenFlow switch works. Um, an OpenFlow switch, uh, open switch is basically a switch that has a flow table that can be programmed by a controller or a PC or a software that runs uh, in a separate, net, uh, in a separate uh, computer in the network. Uh, so you can actually program that flow table to decide where uh, traffic should go, be routed uh, when they are passing to that switch. And if you dive deep in that flow table, you're going to see that each entry has like rules and action and statistics, which basically defines uh, what packets uh, should be matched, or basically that's what the rule does. And an action, decide, it's, it's telling the switch what it should do with packets that match that flow rule. So you can basically match by lots of things, for example, IP uh, ports, or TCP ports, which basically defines the application that are basically using uh, that, uh, that flow. And then you have actions, which are basically forward packets to ports, or encapsulate uh, and forward packets to controller, and then the, the controller will decide what to do with that packet, and also have some statistics. So it's a very simple and clean interface that allows you to control devices uh, using a single software and this, this is a unified interface because if you have like a programmable OpenFlow in a, uh, any vendor switch, you can basically manage them um, using, using the same abstraction and the same software. And uh, so if you take this simple red header, uh, which is also here, this gives you a lot of flexibility. And actually there are lots of uh, proposals in the object optics community to have a similar abstraction for uh, optical uh, interfaces. And they basically propose use of new headers um, and uh, they dive deep and put a lot of uh, information uh, in like new, pack, new, new packets or new management interfaces to control the switches. And so here are at least a few of them, a few of the proposals in the literature. But in general, what they try to do, it's a similar thing, which is basically instantiate a new interface that looks like the original protocol, but they are different, uh, slightly different in some way or the other, but they are all similar. We actually think that this is a, it's not a good approach first, because you're inducing more segregation. And the software you're writing, you have to write software both for a packet network on, or the original open for protocol, and you also have to write software for um, the other part of the network. So you're basically inducing more segregation. And actually, if you have multiple extensions, this ends up having, having an impact on the flexibility you have between different vendors. So if each vendor has a, its own extension, your software also has to address that. So we take a different approach, and we actually try to, to use the same interface of OpenFlow for lower layer devices. And what we do basically um, is try to simplify how we represent an optical network to um, a controller or SDN controller using virtual interfaces that have different bandwidth capacity in a basically a virtual um, photonics cross connect that you can basically do uh, any interconnections. So we don't really uh, define or we don't specify how uh, that will be implemented by the vendor. Um, we basically uh, 
uh, our proposal is actually to simplify provisioning and PCE by asking vendors to provide that functionality and uh, deal with the restrictions in their devices or data switches um, before they actually expose that functionality. So, for example, uh, in this picture, we have uh, a cross-connect that could be done electronically or it could be done in a wavelength basis. Uh, and what you would see uh, or what you would export for a controller would be several interfaces of different capacity in a virtual photonic cross-connect that allow interconnections between all of them. So we actually uh, implemented this, um, or uh, better, Infineer implemented that, that logic, and based on, on the discussions we had and the ideas we had, um, to make it simple for, software, for the software layer to program that. So, and that is what actually goes into the multi-layer provisioning. That's what we, we, we think it's better and easiest way to use a modified open flow protocol and also your unmodified SN controllers to manage both networks. However, there is one case out there, which is uh, usually when you're provisioning um, a route or when you're changing a route in different layers on network, you basically have uh, different provisioning times. So what I mean with that is if you're, for example, changing a hardware table in a router, that happens instantaneously. However, if you're changing, for example, a Cadian switch, that might take some time because, because changing a route in that switch uh, involves the movement of mechanical components. And that has some delays in provisioning. Uh, that ends up actually uh, cutting the connection between two routes, and the application will end up suffering with that. And what is less intuitive here is that that actually happens on transfer devices when you're doing uh, SONET and SD8 uh, routing changes. And even though that happens all electronically, uh, I'm not going to dive into details on that, but we discussed that um, in one of the papers that we, uh, we published and that we, uh, we will leave available in the link. So we actually measured the delay for uh, the SONET and the, the, the Infinera devices and the way we did uh, this measurement, we basically sent packets, uh, numbered packets between these two sites in that uh, topology that I showed again uh, to you, and we changed the circuit only at the transport level, and we measured what is the length or the disconnection time perceived by the application when we're doing that route change. And here in this graph, for example, you can see that the disconnection time is quite large uh, for those devices, and it usually takes uh, a few milliseconds, as you can see in this graph. And what ends up happening if you have traffic being sent at full speed there uh, is that you're going to have a drastic, drastic uh, throughput drop when you're changing the topology. So here, what we show in this graph is that we change the topology at time 10 seconds, and you have a very uh, steep drop, and after the connection is reestablished, CCP will basically um, go back uh, at full speed in the new circuit that you, you do. So what we did here is because we're aware, we are aware of all the, the layers that we're changing and all the routes, or route updates that we're doing, we basically carefully, whenever we're doing topology update, we carefully change, uh, we carefully track uh, when one of the stages or one of the, the layers have completed. And what ends up happening if you do a planned topology update uh, using our system, for example, you have a very minimal impact on application performance when you do a route update. As you can see here uh, on the throughput, over time, when we, say we change the circuit at 10, time 10 seconds. And then the last part is basically uh, our traffic optimization engine, which uh, basically interacts with the devices collecting statistics uh, in conjunction with the multi-layer topology uh, to actually uh, give that statistic, uh, or I don't have with that uh, statistics or traffic, and basically try to figure out what is the best way to reallocate or reorganize the traffic in the network uh, to basically increase uh, utilization of the network and uh, reach any goal that you, you might have uh, in your optimization algorithm. 
And the important part here is um, we try to make this scalable by doing a two-layer statistics collection on the network. So by two, two layer or two stage, we basically, or what it basically means is we have finer grain and a detailed topology or detailed uh, statistics collection for depending on the devices or what the devices can offer us. So what I mean with that is if you're, for example, in a, a transport device uh, that does switching or routing based on TDM slots, uh, you actually have frames uh, that provides you how many bytes were sent on that specific time slot, or in our case would be a virtual port. Uh, however, they don't they don't have any information about flows, but that can be collected to the next uh, router available that supports, for example, open flow that has a list of all the flows that are flowing through that switch. So to keep this scalable, we basically measure uh, bandwidth in a port. Uh, and then whenever we detect that there is an opportunity for optimization, we increase the level of statistics collection to flows and we try to reallocate uh, the traffic. And what is important to mention here as well is that um, because we didn't modify SDN controller, you can actually uh, reuse traffic optimization algorithms uh, or current traffic optimization algorithms uh, with the same controller and the same protocol which in our case was, or the same management protocol, which is, in your case was OpenFlow. So uh, I would like to give you a, an overview of uh, what our controller would do in that scenario that I showed you before. So I have a picture of what we took here, uh, with it again here today in our uh, topology and uh, in our test bed. And with the same experiment, what our controller would do, it would identify uh, what was wrong in that uh, scenario and it would move the large flow to a single circuit on its own where you can, it can achieve 100% of realization. So here is a graph of what happens over time uh, in that scenario and how our controller reacts to that. And I'm going to go with you uh, step by step on what happens here. And as you remember when I explained the scenario, you have a lot of small flows flowing through the first circuit that was only the single circuit that we allocated there. And this circuit has very low utilization because you only have these small flows in this first stage, which goes from time 0 to 30 seconds. So you see that the throughput is not that high. And then there is a point uh, after 30 seconds where we start the large flow, and you see that the throughput of the link uh, cannot, or the circuit that we have initially, cannot really achieve the, um, the high utilization and at that time, uh, it triggers a reaction or in, our, in our controller that would basically involve uh, changes in network statistics collection that we're constantly collecting. And that cycle that I, I mentioned before, statistics collection, traffic engineer, and uh, change, of route, change of routes. And at that stage, we're monitoring changes of stack, extracting combining, combining flow information, identifying flows, and then we're also doing uh, running uh, the uh, we're also running the entire path computation engine to search new paths, and then we basically at the end of all this we do the topology change uh, based on the the uh, uh, traffic engineer that we decide or the traffic engineer decisions that our path computation decide uh, to take, and we allocate a new circuit uh, at time 54, 55. And what happens is, uh, at the end, uh, the large flow that we had achieves nearly 100% of utilization. And what happens in the end is that it allows predictable application performance because you know exactly how much bandwidth that flow is consuming, and you can estimate the time of completion of that. Um, so some observations about what I actually talked to summarize that. Uh, there is a lot of effort going into fast switching. Uh, and with this previous experiment that I showed, uh, for some scenarios, there is also a need for improved network control and reaction time. Because you saw that the reaction here it takes seconds, because there's a lot of things that uh, have to be done in terms of statistic collection, computing uh, new paths, and basically you need better and faster ways to do statistics collection or traffic demand collection in the network. And you also have to uh, 
uh, have better application to network interfaces. Simplified and more efficient to do that. Um, and then also, uh, we, as I mentioned, a uh, faster path computation engine uh, is important. As we noted that uh, in our computation, we have some, uh, some room to improve and make it faster. So this is one of the things that we're also looking at future work. And one another observation that is very, very interesting is that OpenFlow is also moving towards optics. Uh, but it's, it's very shy in terms of what is being uh, specified in the, the new version of the OpenFlow of 1.4. We basically, we basically so, uh, I added support to identify optical ports and powers in the, those optical ports. But there are all the things that we think that should be done there, such as uh, you don't know how much flows you can put, for example, in a switch. And um, in the paper we discussed more better, um, in the paper that we published of this work, we discussed better of what, why this would be interesting and also it would be interesting to know bandwidth granularity that you can allocate in that flow and also switching time that would have uh, help when you are doing provisioning in multiple layers of the network. So to conclude uh, the talk, I would like to leave a message that um, we basically show and provide a prototype uh, of how multi-layer traffic optimization can improve network performance and utilization and it basically can as we shown before. And we also show that plan topology updates, it's important to minimize, minimize performance degradation when we're doing multi-layer topology provi uh, uh, resource provisioning, when we're basically offloading or optimizing the network. And um, we also show and discuss uh, here how intelligent uh, 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 SDN control plane that is, uh, addresses multi-layer uh, topologies uh, can enable practical, practical bandwidth virtualization. And to con last but not the least, uh, I would like to uh, invite you to watch the demo that we had on SDM Central, which is basically a website and a forum uh, that aggregates lots of information about SDN and how it's evolving. So we had a demo with this topology and we show um, we discussed a little bit about the optical transport switch, which is basically the implementation of that abstract interface to manage uh, uh, optical switch implemented by, by Infinera. And we also show other things such as uh, optical bypass, bypass uh, based on uh, demand estimation using our controller. Um, and we, al we also discuss in more detail uh, how the network is structured and what are the detailed decisions on how uh, we, we implemented uh, most of the system. And also here at the bottom I have a reference on the paper that we had on the symposium of high performance interconnects uh, on uh, this work that we, I, I presented today. And we actually uh, got an award for this paper. So I, I invite you to take a look at the paper and uh, see a little bit in more detail of how we implemented this work. So to finalize, I would like to thank uh, Cyan and SF uh, for the support, and also ESNet and Infinera for the collaboration. And I would like to leave uh, my contact information and my advisors if you want uh, more information or you want collaborations and use the system, which is actually open source um, on GitHub. Uh, so I don't have a link here, but I can easily send you uh, a pen request. So I would like to. Uh, finalize that, finalize that uh, now, and I'm open for questions. I actually see that we have two questions here. Um, and I would try, but it looks like it's uh, basically sound, okay, it was sound issues, technical issues. So I'm open for questions. Uh, if anyone wants to to ask anything, uh, that's your opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. Oh yeah, so there is one question here uh, from William. 
Uh, I can see the last name. Uh, so the question is, how do you manage to run optical transport nodes with OpenFlow 1.0? Do we implement some translation agents between the controller and the node? Uh, so basically, um, what, I, what we do is we define a, the virtual interfaces, uh, and I can actually go back there. Uh, to that slide. Oh, here. Uh, so what we basically do is uh, we did not implement the low-level translation between OpenFlow uh, mass or, or OpenFlow protocol and functionalities and the actual uh, photonic uh, chip. We basically specify an abstract interface and then we work with Infinera that they implement your own uh, open transport switch. Uh, they actually have a paper on how they designed and implemented that on their own. But what is important to note here is that the implementation of an optical transport switch might be vendor specific. So we or whoever has implemented a controller and doing the traffic engineering um, leaves that decision uh, to the actually whoever is implemented, whoever is implementing the interface. And what we actually think it's the best way to move forward with that is if the, the vendor basically implements that and provides an abstraction that is compatible with OpenFlow, so we can use unmodified controllers and manage the network uh, using the, the same software that we've been using today, but actually using the other things that I mentioned like multi-layer path provisioning uh, that we implemented also in our controller. So I hope that answers the question. If not, please uh, send me an email. I'll be happy to follow up with that. So there's another uh, question here, which is how much of the SDN controlling is being moved from softer to harder uh, employing FPGAs or ASICs. Um, let me see if I understand this question. So, if I understood it well, um, uh, the question is how much of the the software logic we're putting on FPGAs or ASICs? And if I understood it well, um, the answer is we're not really implementing anything on an FPGA or ASICs. We, um, we, are from, we are aware of some papers that actually uh, do that to do uh, some optimizations and uh, speed ups of uh, control in, in hardware, uh, but we're not really adopting that or we're not, we didn't really do that at this work. We basically use the software only approach uh, and uh, everything uh, that we've done, we've done so far is in software. I'm happy to uh, to work on that as well uh, uh, in the future, but we we didn't do that at this time. Yeah. So there is another uh, another question or another follow up is, are you uh, for seeing a hard implementation um, of your controller? Uh, I'm certainly sure that uh, the the controller itself or parts of it could actually be uh, take take advantage of the FPGA or any other hardware that could be used, for example, for statistics collection and to provide fast uh, statistics collection in terms of hardware optimizations. So, in my view, um, I would say that this is one of the points uh, that would that could benefit from a hardware implementation. Because statistic collection uh, today is one of the bottlenecks that we actually saw in the controller. So um, I think, I hope this answered the question. Um, so if not, please uh, send me an email. So there is another question here from Dan Cooper. Uh, and his question is, um,
So the question is, my, uh, is that he, he says that Infinera uh, basically pre-provisions the light paths beforehand and moves the traffic from light path, one light path to another using um, OTN switching. Was this the case for your studies? Um, so I believe that that was actually the case. Uh, but as I show uh, in one of the graphs, or basically here, uh, you see that even with pre-provisioning uh, of paths, uh, so before I actually talk about it, um, I can't really affirm how the, the, uh, how the lower, uh, how the system was behaving in the Infinera site. I, I understand that that's uh, one strategy that is being used not only for, by Infinera, but some, some others as well. But what we try to do is to abstract away from how that is managed and basically handle uh, any, any way uh, or any lower level provisioning that happens in an abstract way. So, for example, even if uh, that is done in basically pre-provisioning light paths, uh, in, term, in, in the case of Infinera side, we even, we, we even have this connection when we're doing the circuit movement. And that, as I show here, uh, affects application performance. So what we try to do is, regardless of uh, uh, light path being pre-provisioned or not, we basically do this uh, multi-layer topology or multi-layer uh, circuit provisioning or route provisioning in a way that we don't cause any harm to applications by basically uh, being aware of different times to provisioning uh, a circuit or connectivity between two nodes. Uh, so I hope that uh, answers your question. And basically, I would like to finalize. That is, uh, our, our controller can provide uh, a good uh, offloading without any harm to an application, regardless of how uh, the lower level provisioning is, is being done. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, then if not, please uh, send me an email. I would be happy to follow up with you on that. So there's another question uh, from Wei Young. So his question is, So his question is, is there any future plan to make protocol extensions uh, for finer granularity? Um, and he follows up, uh, you think about using OpenFlow 1.4 library uh, that also provides better pack packet inspection, such as traffic rate. So uh, I believe that there is, uh, we can basically, what we're doing actually is we can use both OpenFlow and packet sampling uh, to do deeper uh, packet inspection and know and gather information about flows. And we actually discussed um, trade-offs between these two approaches in the paper. And we actually, we actually believe that, uh, I might have misunderstood your question, but we actually believe that with OpenFlow 1.0, because it also, also provides statistics about uh, flows matching rules, uh, we already have information about throughput or traffic rate that you, you mentioned. Basically by getting the traffic collectors, uh, or the traffic counters, I'm sorry, and analyzing how they change over time. So if we're doing that analysis on, on OpenFlow, uh, on OpenFlow data collected from switches, we actually can, we can know, we already know what is the traffic rate. Now, what you're saying, OpenFlow 1.4 can actually reduce the, the, the time to gather those statistics if you're, it already keeps a traffic rate. So that is something that can actually be done in hardware to help the controller and minimize the reaction time. Just as uh, um, Sale was uh, ma mentioned to a, or mentioned, uh, what is the optimization that you can do in terms of hardware? So the hardware in this case, or in this question, can actually already provide us this information so we don't have to 
to compute that in, in software. And that could be an optimization for the system uh, moving forward. So I hope that answers your question. If not, please send me an email and we follow up on that. Uh, and there is uh, one last question here. I think we're reaching the, the time limit. Uh, so I'm going to answer this one and let's see if we have more. How do you, uh, how, how is the controller aware of application type? And do you have an application or a mechanism or using a TCP IP mapping with the application type? That is actually a very, very good question. Uh, so uh, in terms of being aware of application, that is actually relative to how much control you have, or you have over the network and actually over the, the applications that are running traffic over that network. So if you think like, uh, if you think of a carrier such as ESNet, for example, which uh, interconnects lots of research centers across uh, the country and also Europe and universities as well. Or, for example, uh, AT&T that is provisioning uh, resources, uh, network resources, or any other long distance uh, wide area network provisioning. They actually don't have control over their applications. They don't have control over their applications. They are running traffic through the network. And so that means that with all that information, you basically have to infer uh, that by doing, for example, packet sampling and inspecting open flow tables at the switch. And that is basically what we're trying to do. Because in our scenario, even though we're generating traffic, uh, we are envisioning uh, carriers that don't actually have control over the applications that are putting traffic on the network. Now, if you're Google, for example, or Amazon, that they, they have their private uh, network interconnecting their data centers, you actually are more aware of what applications are generating traffic and what are the characteristics of the, those traffic. So that makes the problem a little bit easier because you already know in advance what you're sending on the network and you can basically manage that before that traffic gets into the network. Um, that is one improvement that you could have if you have that level of control, but we're not assuming that and we're basically trying to go on the hard path and figure out, figure out what is in the network. However, there's a lot of work in SDN that is basically trying to do this application-centric interface that the application could tell your SDN controller what is what is about to do or what to say, and that information is valuable. Uh, and there's a lot of work trying to standardize that and come up with a with a way, a standardized way, the applications can do that. So, what the message I have here is that because we don't change the OpenFlow protocol or the SDN controller, uh, we can still do that with our our system, uh, but we didn't adopt something yet, and we left that for future work. Instead, we're basically trying to inspect the network and identify what is the best optimization for the, the applications that we infer from the, that uh, inspection that we do on the, the network. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, if not, please send me an email. So I think uh, we're over time. Uh, we're, we have one minute left. Uh, Trin, uh, do you want to take over? Well, thank you all for attending, by the way. And I'm going to hand to Tring now uh, for final remarks. Thanks. OK. Just want to thank everybody for signing on and also thank Enrique for um, all of his work on doing this presentation. Uh, we will have another one in December. The next one will be with Karen Bergman from Columbia. So again, thank you very much, everyone. And have a great holiday.